Good morning, everybody. Uh, first, or good evening, I don't know. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> so in the next hour, we're going to uh, talk about the update in regard to the new uh, WHO uh, classification for uh, thyroid tumors. So I guess the best uh, way to start this talk is by this statement from the French Canadian pathologist, which was done a long time ago, maybe 70 years ago, when he said that no classification is more difficult to establish than that of thyroid carcinoma. Of all cancers, they teach perhaps the greatest lesson of humility to uh, histopathologists. Uh, so what is the basis of this uh, new WHO 2022 classification of thyroid neoplasm? Obviously, uh, uh, the basis is the same as has been done for many, many years, for decades, cell of origin, histopathology, how the tumor is growing, of course, now molecular profile, and perhaps what really made the difference here is we really took into account the biologic behavior of uh, the tumor in many of the entities. So, so the old uh, classification that I put here uh, for your reference, and uh, this is uh, the new one, and you can see there are plenty of uh, changes. Uh, you notice one interesting thing here, so we brought the concept of low-risk neoplasm, so again, a behavioral uh, concept. So I have to tell you that some of the changes are clinically important. Uh, for example, the one that relates to the definition of non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasts with papilla-like nuclear features, or NIFT-P. The one related to the uh, position of invasive encapsulated follicular vent of papillary carcinoma, which is discussed separately from papillary thyroid carcinoma, from classical papillary carcinoma. Uh, the introduction of the cons new concept of high-grade follicular cell-derived thyroid carcinoma, the fact that now squamous cell carcinoma is a form of uh, anaplastic carcinoma and not discussed separately. Um, another important change is that cribriform molecular uh, thyroid carcinoma, which was before just a subtype of papillary carcinoma, is now a separate entity, is not considered a papillary carcinoma, it's just considered a tumor on certain histogenesis. And finally, in regard to medullary uh, thyroid carcinoma, we introduced the concept of grading. Now, there are also other changes, which in my opinion, of are of relatively little clinical impact. For example, the term variant uh, is replaced by the term subtype. Um, because HERTO cell is a misnomer, um, we prefer to use term for HERTO cell adenoma and HERTO cell carcinoma as we prefer to use the term oncocytic adenoma, oncocytic carcinoma. The entity known, a very rare entity known as sclerosing mucoepidermoid thyroid carcinoma uh, is uh, uh, considered a tumor of uncertain histogenesis. And we try to kill the term papillary carcinoma uh, because really it's not a histologic subtype of papillary carcinoma, it's based on size. And instead of just saying papillary mycocarcinoma, we're going to have to say uh, papillary uh, carcinoma carcinoma classic, 0.5 centimeters, so on. Um, another uh, also um, a change of little clinical impact uh, is that the entity follicular adenoma with papillary features is considered now separate from uh, follicular uh, adenoma. And finally, um, you know, in view of the controversy in regard to whether uh, multinodular goiter is a collection of hyperplastic nodules or, or a benign neoplastic lesion or a mixture of both. Uh, in order to not address this controversy, in order to 
calm everybody, so to speak. Uh, we introduced the term of follicular nodal disease for this uh, multifocal hyperplastic neoplastic lesion that occur in the clinical setting of uh, multinodular uh, goiter. So now let's start with uh, the changes that have significant impact uh, on the patient. Uh, let's start with our nemesis, our big enemy, the follicular vent of papillocarcinoma and its associated lesion known as NIFP. So here I'm going to uh, take a kind of unusual uh, type of approach. I'm going to take you through the history of the classification to th of thyroid carcinoma to let you know how we got there and how we are trying to fix it. So uh, the story starts in the 1950s. At that time, it was very easy to be a thyroid pathologist because, you know, you label the lesion just based on the growth pattern. If the tumor had papillae, you call it papillary carcinoma. If the carcinoma had follicles, follicular carcinoma. If uh, it's an uh, if there are, uh, it's an admixture of papillary and follicles, then it's called mixed uh, papillary uh, and uh, follicular carcinoma. But a big uh, change happened in the 1960s and 70s. Um, a pathologist from uh, California, Dr. Stuart Lindsay, in 1960, described the papillary carcinoma nuclei, and he thought, uh, he realized that this uh, nuclear characteristic like clearing, um, overlapping irregular nuclear membrane uh, are found not only in papillary tumors, but also in tumor with a follicular growth pattern. And he coined the term follicular variant of papillary carcinoma in a monograph that he published that is actually online, if some of you are interested in uh, looking at it. But um, Really, this, this did not take off. It's uh, Dr. Juan Rosai that we all know that in 1977 put uh, this entity on the map where uh, he uh, described uh, the follicular vent of papillary carcinoma in a more uh, detailed fashion. So what Dr. Rosai did in this article, which contains six cases, reported on tumor growing into follicles with papillary carcinoma nuclei. Um, and almost all of these tumors had leaf node metastasis. So there is a little detail that nobody gave attention to, is that all of Dr. Ozai's cases lacked complete encapsulation. So these tumors were not completely encapsulated. They actually were partially or not encapsulated and uh, infiltrative. But after that article that got a lot of uh, success, so to speak, pathologists, I don't know why, I don't know who started in the 1980 to call any tumor that was completely encapsulated with follicular growth, with the nuclear feature of papillary carcinoma, they started to call any of these tumor as uh, encapsulated non-invasive follicular variant as, as carcinoma, even if it didn't contain any invasion. So encapsulated papillary carcinoma, non-invasive follicular variant. And unfortunately, no meticulous study of the outcome of that particular encapsulated follicular variant non-invasive was done for 26 years. So that led to a wide spread use of the follicular venom term, an important decline of follicular adenoma and uh, carcinoma uh, diagnosis. We have to wait until uh, uh, the year 2000 uh, uh, to see some change. What happened uh, it, at that time, we started to understand better the molecular profile of papillary carcinoma, specifically the follicular vent of papillary carcinoma. Genoma. This entity uh, at the molecular profile is different from classical papillary carcinoma, and you can see that it is much closer to follicular adenoma uh, and, and carcinoma. And one of the first papers on this subject done by uh, Yuri Nikiforov uh, 
who is now at the University of Pittsburgh, where we genotype a bunch of follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. And you can see that they have a lot of RAS mutation, like follicular adenoma and carcinoma, and it's different from classical papillary carcinoma. They have very little B RAS mutation, different from uh, follicular adenoma, uh, like, sorry, like follicular Red PTC mutation, similar to a follicular adenoma, and quite different from classical papillary carcinoma, as far as its uh, chromosomal uh, gains and losses. So, after looking at this data, one should ask themselves, does the follicular vat of papillary carcinoma behave like papillary carcinoma? Uh, is it really a subtype of papillary carcinoma or not? And uh, that's why when I undertook this study with uh, my colleagues at Memorial and my colleague Giovanni Italini from the University of Bologna, this was some time ago in 2006, so it's talking about uh, 16 uh, years ago, and uh, what we did here, uh, we looked uh, at in our hospital at a large number of uh, follicular uh, lesion uh, that were called follicular variants, follicular adenoma, and follicular carcinoma between 1980 and 1995. We excluded. A lot uh, tumors with a lot of sub-centimeter separate foci of uh, or uh, separate foci of papillary carcinoma because how can you study the uninodular follicular vent if it's living with 10, 15 uh, micro uh, carcinoma? We also excluded the sub-centimeter lesions because we know they do very well. So what we got is two types of animals, so to speak. The encapsulated uh, follicular vent when you see the capsule here and uh, there's a clear follicular growth pattern and the inset you see tumor with enlarged clear overlapping nuclei so the typical nuclear features of uh, papillary carcinoma on the other hand you have a totally different animal here which is a tumor with a lot of fibrosis and uh, this tumor lack a complete capsule as they infiltrate the neuro, you can see the neuroplastic follicles infiltrating in between uh, the non-neuroplastic uh, ones. And when you look at uh, the leaf node spread of this lesion, it's really shocking to see that the infiltrative follicular variant have 65% leaf node metastasis. Uh, basically like classical papillary carcinoma. And this is what Dr. Ozai described in 1977. And the other one, the encapsulated follicular vent, have very little lymph node metastasis. Those with capsular and or vascular invasion have 17% only. And those who are non-invasive instead, in that study, have 0% uh, lymph node uh, metastasis. But perhaps the most important finding from this study is there were encapsulated follicular vent without invasion treated by lobectomy alone and uh, there were 31 cases and no there was no recurrence and no lymph node metastasis despite a median follow-up of 11 years and a median size of 2.3 uh, centimeters now, other studies have uh, confirmed uh, these findings. There was one case from uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston where the patient recurred, but the tumor was at the margin, so we don't know the capsule invasion status. Dr. Virginia Livolsi, that we all know, published uh, uh, one uh, case, uh, one case that actually had distant met, but after I spoke with Dr. Livolsi, she told me that the whole capsule was not actually examined in this case, so we don't know really if there was or not uh, capsular or vascular invasion. Now, I don't want you to leave this talk thinking that any encapsulated follicular event will not give you problems. Uh, what I was talking about were the encapsulated follicular event without invasion. 
But if you have invasion, especially if you have an angel invasion, you can actually have problem like in this particular uh, case where you have vascular invasion here and here and the nuclear feature of papillary carcinoma here and you can see that this nasty tumor traveled to, to the rib interestingly bypassing the lymph nodes which is a typical behavior of follicular carcinoma or a RAS mutated uh, tumor. Uh, so, since we have two subtypes of follicular van, then we were interested to see what is the genotype. And if you look at the data here, you can see that the encapsulated follicular van have no BRAF mutation. This is a study we did in 2010. And while they have 36% RAS mutation, in contrast, the infinity follicular van have BRAF mutations. <laughs> 26% the study, some RAS mutation, but not as much as the for encapsulated follicular variant. And the encapsulated follicular variant has no red PTC mutation and can have PAX8 uh, PPR gamma. So in 2014, a very important study was performed in the United States uh, on, uh, it was a big network or, of multiple hospital uh, funded by the U.S. government, uh, the federal government, where uh, uh, geno the gen uh, genotyping of 400, almost 500 papillary carcinoma was done, but really uh, uh, deep genotyping using nine molecular uh, uh, platforms. And uh, this study has shown that follicular event as a whole is clearly a distinct molecular uh, entity. You can see here that in almost every uh, platform used, whether it's messenger RNA, micro RNA, methylation platform, or protein expression, the follicular event of papillary carcinoma has a distinct profile different from classical and, and uh, dwarfism. So you can see here, and we even put that in our paper in 2006, that the follicular event of papillary carcinoma seems to be composed of two entities, uh, so uh, to speak, the encapsulated follicular event, which is closer to follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma, depending whether it has invasion or not, it will behave like follicular adenoma, it has invasion, it will behave like follicular carcinoma, and the infiltrative follicular event that is much closer to a classical papillary carcinoma. And actually in 2006, when we did this paper with Giovanni, we uh, thought that maybe this entity should be reclassified as a close entity to the follicular adenoma carcinoma group of tumor. So countless number of patients with non-invasive follicular vent will be treated by lobectomy only and spread the unnecessary side effect of therapy with its attached morbidity, financial cost, and also the psychosocial uh, impact of a cancer uh, uh, diagnosis. But there were obstacles. Uh, we failed to do that, obstacles from endocrinologists who really wanted to give radioactive iodine right and left, who didn't care about the size of the lesion because of the thinking that radioactive iodine does not have side effects. Actually, it has side effects. It uh, can, uh, you know, uh, fry your salivary gland, so you can have uh, tooth problems, even with small, it can dry the lacrimal uh, glands. Uh, it lowers the blood count, the sperm count, even uh, it has in certain doses a small, but definitely risk of uh, leukemia. Also, we had to battle surgeons who many, even on the same island in Manhattan, in New York, where I live, did not uh, really understand the biologic uh, behavior of papillary carcinoma. They wanted to overtreat the microcarcinoma. And finally, the people to blame are us, experts, pathologists, who failed to communicate the extremely indolent nature of the non-invasive uh, encapsulated uh, follicular family uh, because you sent it to one pathologist, uh, they call it benign, another 
the malignant, and when they call it malignant, they don't tell you that this is a very, very malignant condition. So after 30 long years of overcalling and over eating, finally uh, things uh, came uh, to an end with this uh, study uh, where uh, done by a large number of pathologists that I'm sure you were aware about, most of you, if you work in thyroid, in JAMA Oncology in April 2016, uh, related to the nomenclature revision for encapsulated follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. So what we uh, did in this study, we were 24 endocrine pathologists from throughout the world. Uh, we had a surgeon, two endocrinologists, and even one psychiatrist who whose main uh, really interest was the impact of the nomenclature of uh, disease on patients. And he told us that, you know, the only, the only fact that you label a patient as a cancer patient that will create enough anxiety so the patient will accept to be over-treated. So in that study, there were 109 non-invasive encapsulated cases uh, that were analyzed, not treated with radioactive iodine, and each case who had at least 10 years follow-up, so a median follow-up of uh, 13 years, and there was uh, no recurrence. And these cases were approved. We concurred that this aphrodite event, it was by 24 endocrine pathologists agreed on that, and only one was aware of the outcome uh, of these cases. So we choose this term that's kind of long, uh, but it, it hopefully it is clear. It's a non-invasive folly. We, we decided to call the encapsulated follicular vent non-invasive as non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. Obviously, adequate sampling of the entire tumor capsule, actually sampling of the entire capsule should, should uh, be done to arrive to this uh, diagnosis. So how do we diagnose uh, NIFT-P? So the most important thing is to exclude vascular and encapsular invasion. Uh, you also have to be sure uh, the tumor is obviously encapsulated or clearly demarcated. And obviously it has the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. You have to exclude any high-grade features like tumor necrosis or mitotic activity of three mitosis or not. And then there is a specific uh, point of uh, contention here, which is the number of papillary. What happens in papillary carcinoma, as I'll show you, the more papillary you have in a lesion, the more, the higher chance you have of sniff node metastasis. But we thought that we can accept less than 1% uh, papillary. However, um, after this study was uh, performed, um, and uh, published uh, three studies showed nodal metastasis in NIFP with 0% papillary and uh, like for example 2 to 5% nodal metastasis in 0% papillary and 3% is less than 1% papillary. Uh, now however two of the papers did not exclude cases with separate papillary carcinoma. So then you cannot really judge here. You you cannot tell whether the lymph node meds comes from the NIFP in question or from the separate person living with it. Um, and then um, there's only one really paper which I think had a good study design uh, because they, they excluded separate papillary carcinoma. However, uh, they did not analyze the primary and the met at the molecular level. And we know that sometimes you can have a metastasis from a papillary microcassin that is not picked up by the sampling or that is uh, embedded uh, within uh, the block or that has regressed. So uh, because of uh, this paper, there was a reaction by some of us in the NIFP group and we tried to change the criteria from less than 1% to papillary to no uh, papillae uh, allowed. Um, I thought personally that was uh, too much, it was a too nervous uh, reaction. So I undertook this study uh, with a long title, 
were basically with again my colleague Giovanni Tallini, where we uh, assess the percentage of papillae in uh, encapsulated papillary carcinoma, 235 unifocal encapsulated uh, papillary carcinoma. I won't show you all the details, but uh, I will show you first that there was a clearly relationship between the percentage of papillae, this column here going up, and the chances of lymph node metastasis. For example, nobody, whether even if the, in the cases that had invasion, if you have less than 1% papillae, you don't have lymph node metastasis. But of course, if you have 15% or more papillae, you start to have much more lymph node metastasis. Same correlation between the amount of papillae and the presence of PRAF. If, uh, if the number of papillae go up, the chances of the tumor being BRAF positive increase. And if the number of papillae goes down, uh, the chance of the tumor uh, being RAS mutated also uh, uh, increases. But perhaps more important for this discussion today here is what happened to those encapsulated non-invasive uh, papillary uh, carcinoma. So here, you have to wait for 10% papillae to start to have lymph node metastasis. Um, again, here, the same relationship. Uh, the more papillae you have, the more BRAF uh, mutations uh, you have. And the less papillae you have, the more RAS uh, mutation you have. So I repeat here, you need 10% of papillae to have lymph node metastasis encapsulated uh, non-invasive papillary uh, carcinoma. So because of this study and many others, uh, we arrived to the conclusion uh, in the WHO that that criteria should remain. It's okay to have a few papillae in the lesion. Uh, however, uh, we added uh, one criterion that if you have BRAF uh, B600 E positive, then uh, the lesion is not a lift B uh, anymore. I have seen cases that look lift be under the microscope, but after you do BRF 1600, they are positive, are usually cases that contain some, uh, some uh, tall cells. Uh, <clears throat> however, I've seen only one lift P, I'm sure it is an lift P histologically that was BRF positive, but because, you know, biology is not uh, perfect. So these are now the new criteria for lift P. We, uh, the less than 1% papillary remains, but BRF 1600 is uh, should be negative, should not be uh, positive. But we also expanded the NIFP concept. Initially, uh, some pathologists were afraid that sub-centimeter NIFP uh, cannot be diagnosed as NIFP. Now, our paper, another group, also showed uh, that uh, this uh, is uh, possible. Uh, now, also some pathologists, especially in England, in the UK, were nervous regarding DFP with oncocytic features. We showed in a paper that these also do not uh, recur and uh, they can be diagnosed. And finally, some endocrinologists were very nervous about the very large DFP, more than four centimeters. We also showed that these uh, do not recur. Obviously, in that situation, I would advise everybody to be super careful and to really uh, submit the entire capsule. That's no no way. Anyway, in any DFP, you have to submit the entire capsule. So let's look at the impact of uh, NIFP. What are why are we doing doing all this? Um, in the latest the latest paper show an impact of probably forty thousand seven thousand cases worldwide each year. Uh, thinking that if you include DFP in the papillary carcinoma group, they represent 9% of papillary carcinoma with significant variation. You have much more of this diagnosis in North America and much less in uh, Asia. Um, now, uh, obviously, but every time you spare a patient a uh, carcinoma diagnosis, you, uh, especially if the tumor is large, you're going to diminish the side effect of completion uh, thyroidectomy, like uh, recurrent nerve injury, hypopyrethroidism, or thyroid hormone replacement. You can diminish the side effect of radioactive iodine therapy. We spoke about it. Of course, the healthcare costs, these are very old numbers, but it's much more 
expensive in the U.S. to have a completion lobectomy to give radioactive iodine. And also the psychological and financial burden of a cancer diagnosis. We never talk about it, but um, there are definitely a big psychological and financial burden. For example, in some countries, they won't give you, the bank won't give you a loan to buy an apartment if you have a, a cancer uh, diagnosis. So, uh, in addition to the changes related to NIFT-P, uh, based on all the study I showed you, it's clear that encapsulated follicular vent with invasion is different from papillary carcinoma because it has a different biologic behavior, where not the spread, if any, a different molecular profile, RAS. Uh, really, it behaves like a follicular carcinoma. We didn't change the the, the name to follicular carcinoma, but at least we started to separate it by uh, uh, put it in a as a separate entity from papillary carcinoma. It's not under the papillary carcinoma section of the chapter. So finally, we're gonna close the issue of follicular vent FDP with this uh, statement from uh, Charles Darwin who said that to kill an error is as a good service and sometimes even better than establishing uh, a new truth uh, or fact. Now let's uh, jump to another subject, which is the subject of pirate question with intermediate prognosis. So um, all clinician, uh, this is a statement from Dr. Warner, who's a pathologist at Mayo Clinic, and he said that clinician, the old clinician used to think that the classification of thyroid cancer was very simple. There was a group of well-differentiated slow-growing slow tumor that never killed anybody and a group of rapidly growing tumor that killed everybody. And uh, Dr. Rosar uh, used to tell us as his fellow that when he was interested in thyroid at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, one of his uh, other surgeons there uh, made fun of him and said, there's nothing about thyroid, it's very boring, that you have either tumor that don't kill anybody or tumor that kill everybody. Well, uh, that surgeon was wrong, Dr. Ozar was right. Uh, there are tumor in between. Uh, they have been labeled for many years as poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. They are tumor of follicular cell origin, showing histologic and prognostic features intermediate between well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma, like papillary carcinoma, and anaplastic carcinoma. And here we have to thank Dr. Ozai for putting this entity on the map uh, in 1984, where he described insular carcinoma. Uh, these are uh, these uh, tumors with an insular, uh, insular in Latin means uh, islands, uh, islands of uh, tumor cells, and they uh, resemble very much uh, Tumor and Dr. Ozai acknowledged it in his paper that was described by the German pathologist uh, Paul Longhans in, uh, sorry, Theodor Longhans in uh, 1907 uh, uh, as proliferating uh, stroma. So when you have a solid trabecular insular growth pattern, when you have necrosis, capture and vascular invasion, everybody agrees, and you don't have an aplastic feature, everybody agrees that these tumor are poorly differentiated uh, thyroid uh, carcinoma. But uh, what do you do if you have solid growth pattern alone or mitosis and necrosis alone? Here is the rub here where people really uh, disagree. So let's see two approaches to the issue. The first one was done in 2004 by this very good uh, group from Italy, Dr. Mauro Papotti, where they uh, defined uh, poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma on the basis of trabecular solid insular growth pattern, irrespective of mitosis and necrosis. And if you look at the data, the cases are really in between uh, well differentiated thyroid carcinoma and aplastic thyroid carcinoma, 83%. Uh, of sur for survival at five years. But when they developed a numerical scoring system and the main component of that scoring system is necrosis, you uh, can see 
that the cases with necrosis do uh, very well, they even do better than papillary carcinoma. So clearly, uh, I don't think it's a good idea to cause something poorly differentiated carcinoma when, as a group, it behaves better than papillary carcinoma. I don't know if there's any tumor carcinoma in the human body that behaves better than papillary carcinoma. But when you have necrosis, the tumor is in between uh, well differentiated and anaplastic uh, thyroid uh, carcinoma. So, uh, however, there was an opposite view, and I had this idea in 2006, say, why don't we define them on the basis of mitosis and necrosis, irrespective of growth patterns? So, basically, uh, the opposite uh, uh, concept. And when you look at these cases defined solely on the basis of mitosis, I took five mitosis per 10 hyperview and or tumor necrosis, you can see that you have cases like the one on the left where uh, they have a solid uh, or nested uh, growth pattern and they contain necrosis. These are cases that everybody agrees upon are poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And you have uh, cases with <clears throat> Uh, papillae or follicular growth pattern, but with necrosis. And here we at Memorial for many years were the only people labeling this tumor fully uh, differentiated thyroid carcinoma. So when you look at uh, poorly differentiated carcinoma defined on the basis of mitosis and necrosis, they have a five year survival at uh, 60%. So really in between well differentiated and anaplastic. And when you look at the variables that affect outcome with this, this group of tumor, things like margin and extrathyroid extension, of course, make uh, a lot of stance and will guide the outcome. But probably what is more interesting, what did not influence survival, the growth pattern, solid versus follicular papillary, did not influence uh, growth pattern as well as the cell type. So after this, uh, uh, our paper, uh, a group of pathologists gathered in Torino, Italy, led by Dr. Ozai, where they came with this uh, definition for poorly differentiated carcinoma that has been adopted in the latest WHO and has been worldwide used, uh, where you need to have solid nested insular growth pattern. You need to have an absence of the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. And at, at least one of the following features, a mitotic index of three mitosis and 10, so here there is congruence with the memorial approach. You have at least to have tumor necrosis or something called convoluted nuclei, which I understood mean hyperchromatic papillary carcinoma nuclei. So when you look at uh, the data here, also the tumor are in between papillary and anaplastic, poorly differentiated. However, when you look at all the data, all the non-anaplastic cases, those cases without necrosis, whether they are papillary or poorly differentiated, they do very, very well. They uh, behave like uh, papillary uh, uh, carcinoma. So here again, you can see that it doesn't make much sense to call a tumor uh, poorly differentiated when it has a behavior similar to uh, papillary uh, carcinoma. So uh, we at Memorial for many years have uh, used the poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma definition based on mitosis and necrosis because it's the main cause of radioactive iodine Factory disease, and most patients who died of who die of non-anaplastic carcinoma die of radioactive iodine refractory disease. Many of these radioactive iodine refractory poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma are initially diagnosed as a classical uh, papillary carcinoma, HER2 cell or follicular carcinoma. And here you have to put yourself in the shoes of the clinician when she or he has to face a patient with classical papillary, they usually tell them you have one of the most indolent tumor in the human body. Congratulations. We will, uh, hopefully when I retire, I will uh, send you, I will uh, transfer you to my uh, partner who will succeed me. Imagine the deception of this clinician and patient 
when the patient comes back, not only with a recurrence after three or four years, but also with a tumor that is refractory to radioactive iodine, and the patient has to be sent to a tertiary care center like Memorial or MD Anderson or Pekka Memorial for uh, targeted uh, therapy. We also did a study on non-anaplastic thyroid carcinoma and found out that the main uh, cause of death from non-anaplastic thyroid carcinoma are these poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma defined on the basis of mitosis and necrosis. To bring this to light, so to speak, uh, look at this uh, case of a 72-year-old man with a 5.5 centimeter mass. The mass is made, has a solid nested growth pattern. It has a high mitotic rate, but clear nuclei. Uh, uh, so this case, uh, if you use the three proposal, will be called papillary carcinoma solid variant, which has a 90% survival 10 years. If you use the memorial definition, it would be a poorly differentiated carcinoma. And what happened to this patient? Unfortunately, the patient died four years after diagnosis of pertubral and lung uh, 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 metastasis. So this is here the price of, uh, 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 in my opinion, uh, not having the ideal uh, nomenclature. So what we did in the WHO, we reconciled these two, these two definitions. So now for intermediate uh, prognosis for liquor cell derived carcinoma, we have one appellation, one name for liquor derived carcinoma high grade. The tumor has to be invasive and it has to have high grade feature either by the presence of mitotic count and tumor necrosis and very important, no anaplastic histology. So this new entity here has two subtypes. Poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma defined on the basis of the Turin proposal and a differentiated high grade uh, thyroid carcinoma that are defined as we show you using the memorial uh, uh, definition. So he, who is here is going into detail. So I repeat for the Turin proposal. So if you have a tumor with a solid growth pattern, and no features of papillary carcinoma, you need to have one of the following three features, a mitotic count, tumor necrosis, or convoluted nuclei. Now, that was the 2017 definition of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And this tumor will be called poorly differentiated because if you use, uh, you define differentiation as how close the tumor is from the adult organ, this tumor looks poorly differentiated because they have a solid instead of follicular growth that are closer to the fetal thyroid organ. However, you have high grade tumor with a lot of mitosis and necrosis that their architecture is close to the adult organ, they have papillae or follicles. So this tumor that were not included in the old poorly differentiated definition, but now are included under follicular DF carcinoma high grade, are uh, called differentiated high grade thyroid carcinoma. Here you can have papillary and follicular growth, like, sorry about that, like the tumor above here, with uh, necrosis that is needed, either tumor necrosis or a mitotic count of five or two square millimeter, one of those, and no anaplastic features. And these two tumors have the same. Uh, outcome. Uh, they have, however, overall different molecular profile. Uh, be, uh, the poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma, because it excludes tumor with papillary carcinoma, is mainly a RAS mutated driven tumor with very few BRAF cases. And the differentiated high grade thyroid carcinoma are tumor that are mainly BRAF uh, driven because uh, they include cases with papillary carcinoma and nuclei. So that what I showed you was a very important uh, change in the WHO. Another change uh, is the entity squamous cell carcinoma of the thyroid. 
So in the 2017 WHO, this was considered a separate entity from anaplastic carcinoma. Now it's a form of anaplastic carcinoma. And the reason for that, first of all, let me tell you how it is defined in the 2017 WHO. It was defined as a tumor composed entirely of tumor cells with squamous differentiation. No papillary carcinoma with it, and no follicular carcinoma with it. And we looked at this tumor in the paper that we published. We found out that 60% have BRF mutations. And also we found out that the outcome, as you see from the Kaplan Mary curve on the left, are similar to uh, a, a, an aplastic carcinoma as a whole, clearly showing that this tumor deserves to be just a subtype of an aplastic uh, carcinoma. Now there is an uh, important detail regarding anaplastic carcinoma that is not a classification issue really, but I really want to communicate to you because that has been a game changer in the treatment. Every time you have an anaplastic carcinoma, it's mandatory to check the BRF status. It can be done using immunohistochemistry, which is quite rapid, or genotyping. And this is crucial because those patients who are BRF mutated, as was shown by uh, this study, when you give them BRF inhibitor and MEK inhibitor, this BRF P600 mutated anaplastic carcinoma, there is a chance that they will become resectable. And we have seen high pathologic response rates, and there is durable local regional control. And now, actually, it's an FDA approved and a standard treatment for BRF V600. E mutated anaplastic calcium. So it's really, once you have an anaplastic calcium, it's a really an emergency in my hospital. We have to tell them before the weekend whether it is BRF mutated uh, or not. And this is just to show you this incredible uh, PET scan of treatment and post treatment. And after that, the tumor can be restricted. It won't save the life of the patient, but they will be able for many years, for a few months, at least many months or even years to not have local regional uh, problems. Another uh, change is of clinical significance in the WHO is the one related to the entity cribiform molar variant of papillary carcinoma. Uh, so these tumors we have known now, we know now do not have BRF mutations. Rarely they have RAS or PIK3CA mutation. The main genetic problem of this tumor is a disturbance in the beta catenin pathway. Uh, that's why uh, when they occur within the setting of familial adenomatous polyposis, uh, they uh, have uh, the APC uh, uh, gene is not functioning and the beta catenin is uh, accumulated in this tumor. Any, any problem in the beta catenin pathway will lead to beta catenin accumulation and is typical of this entity. The other important finding that they have always TTF1 expression, but they have an absence of focal weak PAX8 and thyroglobulin expression. So based on that, uh, many uh, clinicians and pathologists think that because this tumor do not make any, any thyroglobulin, because this tumor don't have PAX8, Radioactive iodide may not be needed uh, in uh, in this tumor, but this is something that is new uh, that has to be really demonstrated. But I can tell you, we had a 16 year old with the QB4 molar thyroid carcinoma with metastasis, and the clinician elected not to give radioactive iodine because, in their opinion, this tumor uh, uh, does not is not. Uh, uh, follicular uh, cell uh, derived. So that's why this tumor is put under the category of uncertain uh, histogenesis. Now let me tell you about a very important uh, change with the issue regarding medullary thyroid carcinoma grading. Since the definite histologic description of medullary thyroid carcinoma in 1959 by this physician uh, from the Cleveland uh, Clinic, including Dr. John Beach Hazard and Hoke, who described the tall cell variant, we have been using uh, clinical and molecular characteristics to uh, stratify these uh, patients, like, for example, age, of course, uh, uh, age, sex, serum, uh, CA, and calcitonin. But 
bizarrely, uh, no grading system has been used. And this is surprising because uh, we know that medullary thyroid carcinoma is uh, a neuroendocrine tumor. And we know that neuroendocrine tumors are prone to grading since they are very well established pulmonary and pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasts that have well validated and accepted histologic uh, grading uh, schemes. This state of affair uh, remained until uh, 2020, where two groups, uh, our group from Memorial and the group of Anthony Gill uh, in Sydney, Australia, published uh, two grading uh, system of medullary thyroid carcinoma. Our grading system published a little bit earlier than theirs, was based on tumor necrosis and high mitotic rate and was an independent predictor of poor outcome. Uh, a few uh, months later, they published uh, their own system. The main difference between these two systems, that is one is a two-tiered approach, ours, very simple. You put a tumor in the high-grade category if you have a mitotic index of five per two square millimeter, and or tumor necrosis. The system is more sophisticated. It has a three-tiered approach with an intermediate grade that is a combination of low mitotic count and tumor necrosis, as well as high mitotic count without uh, tumor uh, necrosis. Uh, we learned a lot from uh, these two papers. Uh, um, on You can see here the memorial data, the 144 patient on univariate analysis. We learned that uh, histopathologic pathology parameters such, such as fibrosis were not prognostically significant. Now, in addition to mitosis and necrosis, pleomorphic nuclei made a difference, encapsulation, vascular invasion, exotyroid extension margin, and node size. This is by univariate analysis. But when you go by multivariate analysis, all falls off. And the only uh, the really uh, histopathologic feature that matters are, uh, are mitosis um, and uh, necrosis. The Sydney data had somewhat uh, similar uh, results. After univariate and multivariate analysis, again, the only histopathologic parameter that matters are mitosis and necrosis. Um, fibrosis, amyloid nuclear grade spindle cell, whether you have them or not, prominent nuclear and vascular invasion, all these do not uh, uh, make uh, uh, a difference. Now, after these two papers, a paper from Brigham and Women's Hospital by Dr. Justine Barletta in the, uh, at Boston, validated both of these grading systems in a genotype cohort of sporadic medullary carcinoma. That is great. Uh, these papers are great, but they're not enough. We need a universal grading system. And um, we need one uh, where, and in order to have one, we need consensus cutoff for all indices. We need a large cohort from multiple uh, international uh, centers. So this is where we published the International Medullary Thyroid Carcinoma Grading System in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. This was a very nice collaborative effort. Uh, we gathered 327 patients with resected medullary thyroid carcinoma, cases from Sydney, Australia, from Institut Gustavoussi in Villery, France, uh, led by Dr. Abir Guzlan, the memorial cases, cases from the University of Bologna by Dr. Giovanni Tallini, and cases from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital by Dr. Justine uh, Barletta. We, of course, ma counted mitosis at hotspots per two square millimeters, which is equivalent to 10 hyperfield on most microscope. We did the KI67 count the same way it's gone, done in neuroendocrine tumor with at least 500 cells. We looked for tumor necrosis and a large number of clinical pathologic parameters, such, such as sex, age, uh, tumor size, and of course, uh, stage and status of reaction line mutation. And as far as uh, uh, prognostic endpoints, we looked for overall disease specific, local regional free, and distant metastasis free survival. 
Uh, now, all the cases were looked at by uh, people who are used to head and neck uh, through the um, thyroid tumor, whether they are endocrine or head and neck pathologists. One point here I want to make that we didn't assess the extent of uh, tumor necrosis. We just coded them as present or absent. And this is an example of uh, tumor uh, necrosis. Um, it should be differentiated from FNA induced tumor necrosis. There is no fibrovascular proliferation. You have nuclear debris, abrupt necrosis, so to speak. And uh, you notice here, interestingly, that there are not much nuclear pleuromorphism in this area of uh, necrosis. So what we did uh, on this large cohort, we assayed the memorial system, the Sydney grading system, and eight other potential grading schemes using variance cutoffs for mitotic index KI67 and the tumor necrosis. Finally, all the results were gathered. We hold a consensus. We held a consensus conference, and a single system was agreed upon, called, uh, named the International Medullary Thyroid Carcinoma Grading uh, System. And this system is a two-tiered grading system. Um, and to get into the high-grade category, you need either a mitotic index of five per two square millimeters of more. A K or a KI67 proliferate index of five or more and or tumor necrosis. And it's important in the pathology report to mention the mitosis and the KI67 as continuous uh, variable because uh, the prognosis worsens at the proliferative activity of a tumor uh, increases. Uh, when you look at the data for this international metallic thyroid carcinoma grading system, it's very clear that in every survival endpoint, whether it's overall disease specific, local, regional, or distant metastasis free survival, it's really separating the patients very well. Just to give you numbers here, the 10 year disease specific, specific survival, if you have a low grade, is 97%, and it drops to 53% with high grade. The 10-year distant metastasis free survival for low grade is 84%, and it drops, drops to 31% for a high grade. And the, the prognostic significance of this consensus grading system was maintained for each participating site in regard to overall disease-specific and distant metastasis free survival. Only for local regional free survival, we were not able to reach significance for the Italian uh, cohort. But perhaps the most important slide for this uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma is here. This is the multivariate analysis, and you can see that this grading system is independent from very important other prognostic parameters, including stage, tumor size, postoperative CA, and calcitonin. Uh, external uh, margin status, age, extrathyroid extension, and vascular invasion. Now, uh, this uh, system was validated by an Italian group in an independent cohort of 111 uh, cases. Uh, it predicted survival in uh, disease preserved survival in the entire cohort including in sporadic medullary carcinoma. I don't know why they could not reach, uh, um, a, uh, they could not predict survival, uh, overall survival in the cohort, but they have predicted disease-specific survival. And a study from Brigham and Women showed that this tumor is reproducible among uh, academic uh, pathologists. Uh, just to bring this, uh, to life, so to speak. This is a 66 year old male uh, with no distant met at presentation. This is clear medullary carcinoma. You can see the calcitonin stain on the right, the necrosis, again here with no uh, nuclear pleuromorphism. And the patient unfortunately died of disease two years and three months after thyroidectomy. So, what are the remaining issues for uh, this uh, grading? We still do not know the real relation between mutation and grade in sporadic tumor. One paper showed no correlation between grade and sporadic mutation, but it was a small cohort uh, done by Dr. 
um, uh, by letter from Brigham. Another study from Paris showed the independent value of red vis-a-vis -vis grade. We still don't know the jury is out, but now we are doing a big genotyping study on this large cohort and soon we will have uh, the results. So what's the purpose of all this hard work is we hope that because patients with high grade medullary carcinoma have a worse outcome, they will be may benefit from early lateral neck dissection, close follow up, low threshold for cross sectional imaging and careful work up for distant metastasis. Also, this can be used as data point for clinical trial because one will assume that high grade patient may benefit more from uh, adjuvant uh, therapy. So basically, I would like to close this talk by show you that we are uh, really going toward a new nomenclature in, in tumor that better reflects behavior. That was done a few years ago with the staging system that went from anatomic staging to anatomy and prognostic staging. And you can see here that uh, for histopathologic entity, we should base uh, the uh, definition on prognostically relevant histologic feature rather than clinically irrelevant histopathology because uh, we look, uh, as Dr. Reuter, uh, the Vice Chairman of Memorial said, because at the end, we pathologists are simply clinicians with the microscope. And here I would like to finish with this uh, statement from Julian Huxley, who was a well-known British biologist who said in 1958 in a lecture at the Sloan Kettering Institute just a few hundred meters from my office, uh, that cancer malignancy must be defined according to what the tumor cells do, not what they look like, otherwise the term ceases to have biologic meaning. And if we had done this with the follicular event, we would have spared a lot of patient unnecessary uh, treatment and side effects. So this is the end of the talk. Thank you for uh, your uh, patience and I'll be ready to answer questions. And thank you for the organizer for inviting me.